Welcome everybody to the spring session of the New York Combinatorics Seminar. Our speaker today is Robert Donnelly from Queensboro Community College of the City University of New York. And he will talk about lattice paths. The floor is yours, Robert. Thank you, Sandra. Okay, so first I'd like to thank um, the organizers for the invitation to the seminar and thank you to everyone for showing up. So I've been, um, so before the pandemic, I was a semi-regular attendee to the seminar. With the pandemic, I've become a regular attendee. And so it's real pleasure to finally get the chance to um, speak in the seminar. Um, worth noting, so that we're in 2022, this is my 10th year at CUNY. And about six years ago, Sandra invited me to give a talk at Graph Theory Day, but at the time I was just getting into combinatorics and I didn't have any graph theory problems. So uh, another good thing with today's talk is that I have some graphs to share and they're on the title page. Uh, also note, um, title page, we're in the week of Valentine's Day. So I've got the red theme. And if you squint hard enough, these hexagons, these hypergraphs on the, the front page have some rose-like quality. So let's take a closer look at some of these. Okay, good. So if I was to pitch, okay, so first off, what's going on in the title page? If I was to pitch this to an undergrad um, as a problem, I would ask how many ways can you put six triangles into a regular hexagon so that you have three triangles touching each vertex? The answer to this will be seven. And we'll, of course, the weasel word, word here is equivalence. And so we'll also see it's probably better to say six, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, and what makes these hexagons different? Okay, so what would equivalence be? Of course, we would want to be able to permute the vertices, which will change the orientation of all these triangles. When I do so, like this nested triangle here, will, wherever it goes, it will still stay a triply nested triangle. And then for the middle one, which is an important one that'll come up later, a unique feature here would be the um, single triple shared line. And it also has a vertex with three double edges coming off of it. So these are certainly different in the sense of equivalence. Do another one. We'll look at all seven later on. Um, for a third one, this is, I think, the prettiest one. This is the pinwheel. Here, the the items that um, distinguish it from the other two, we have three um, double edges and they don't touch each other. And so that's gonna be like the punchline for the talk, more or less, is coming back to these and what we can do with them. Okay, so just a little overview, like we'll just do the talk, but if you're just keeping track of where we are in the talk, we'll start with semi-magic squares, We'll talk about lattice paths in the post set of semi-magic squares or a part of it. And that'll bring in Latin rectangles and Latin squares. I'll say more about um, going from the post set of semi-magic squares to its orbit post set under a group action because that'll make things, um, e well, make things easier to look at. And then I'm only gonna do four ca three cases because these are the three cases where, um, well, Things look artistically nice, and um, you could do these three K, four and five, you can definitely do by hand. Six, you can do by hand if you have a lot of time. We'll talk about how that goes. I'll note this is joint work with Wang and Kim. So Wang and is a graduate from the CUNY Grad Center, and so we've kept in touch since then. The preprint that goes with today's talk is on the archive now. So this seems interesting, it's there. And um, also note, I put into the abstract for today's talk, um, the predecessor preprint and um, link to talk and slides. You don't need this talk for today's, or you, you don't need this previous talk for today's talk, but I won't say much about size three. There's a different set of techniques that I use there, which won't apply here so much. Okay, and so that's the overview. And so sort of our big theme 
Okay, well, we're looking at interconnections of semi-magic squares with zero one entries. So these are zero one matrices, Latin rectangles and Latin squares, K uniform, K regular hypergraphs. I'm not gonna talk about it, but these topics bring in all sorts of ideas. There's also say the Burkhoff polytope, bipartite graph, diagrams, and the like. And so these are some very heavy topics, but I'm gonna go for more of um, like, I don't wanna say an undergrad approach, but I'm not an expert on any of these fields really. Um, and there's, I'm aiming for the interconnection between all of them. So um, a lot of the things I'm looking at will come right off just the definitions of things. The art is in putting it all together. And if I found out that what I'm trying to do is somewhere in the literature, I'm fine with that because literature for all these put together is, it's huge. Um, so I'll note, I kind of view this talk as a little bit on the recreational side. It's more kind of um, being at play. The research I'm really interested in, like, you know, pushing forward as a serious research program is this um, Klebsch Gordon theory that's been reevaluated in the last, say, 15 years in terms of combinatorics as the combinatorics of three by three semi magic squares. And so that's really what I'm interested in. But then I started noticing things like um, that could apply to the general case. And it's sort of a, okay, well, let's see, I can do four, I can do five. And then at six, you, there's a reason to sort of stop there. I'll also note, um, the talk's kind of actuarial in nature in that, so I spent, before my 10 years at CUNY, I was an actuary for about three and a half years. And so one of the joys of this project is doing the data collection, the data analysis and the data presentation. And so that's something I'm really paying attention to with all this too. Although, you know, maybe not something I'm going to say out loud, it just kind of shows up as we go through. All right, so let's start with the first section. So we'll just give definitions and kind of go through um, the important features. So semi-magic square, okay, so here we want um, a square matrix, we want non-negative integer entries, and the sum along any row and column that have the same value, which we call the line sum. And I'll denote the line sum by, um, this is supposed to be a rank function for a finite graded flow set, so I'll use that notation. I'll note, we're not doing classical semi-magic squares here where we would want this line sum to also equal the diagonal sums, this is a little bit looser and you can do a, a lot more, not as restricted. Okay, under addition, once we fix our size, we'll have a monoid. So I'll just denote that MN for convenience because that's covered up by the, or I guess my, I can move that, the participant list. And then here's an example where we have line sum equal to, to nine. And then this is a three by three. Okay, and so that's a definition. For examples, okay, so we wanna work up, of course, the zero matrix has, is our one semi-magic square with line sum zero. For line sum one, we'll get permutation matrices. So we'll have a one in every, exactly each row and column. Main reason to just note this is to note, I'll use this as kind of my common notation for permutation matrices will be denoted with the cycle below. And so I'll also, there'll be other, um, ways of thinking of permutations too, but this is um, our three by three. And so we have six of these. And I'll probably use these shortly. Now, we've got permutation matrices as semi-magic squares with line sum one. We can do algebra to create, you know, we wanna use old things to create new things. And so we can do linear combinations. So sums of semi-magic squares, let's just call magic squares, will be magic squares as will um, non-negative integer multiples. And so we can do linear combinations. The line sum is gonna be the expected sum. And then it turns out that that's enough. You can build everything off of the permutation matrices. So it's a Birkhoff von Neumann theorem. Note, this is kind of an applied math talk. So I don't think I have any actual theorems in here. I just call them main results because it's pictures. Um, Burkhoff von Neumann, every semi-magic square can be written as a sum of permutation matrices. And actually that says something more about the Burkhoff polytope, but this is certainly a consequence. 
Okay, um, so that's the good news. We have a spanning set. But then if you're thinking linear algebra, maybe we can get a basis, that's gonna fail pretty quickly. And so for size three, we'll have the sum of the rotations equals the sum of the reflections is equal to the matrix of all ones. And we'll, the common notation throughout the talk. When we get to four, still not gonna work. And there you can argue much more generally. Um, I'll actually note for three, this is the only relation that you need to understand the three by threes. And that's why it's, for me, it's very appealing to study this case. In general though, you've got n factorial permutation matrices, which is gonna far outnumber eventually the um, number of basis vectors you would want for the, the square matrix um, vector space. And so that's, um, we're gonna get lots of relations at the vector space level, definitely at the, the ring level. And then if you want the exact um, dimension for semi-magic matrices where we just allow elements over a field, then that's gonna be the exact one. And these are real interesting to me. I mean, there's not a lot going on, but it's actually very interesting for representation theory, being a sum of squares. Now, to understand the relations, well, that's actually very, that's a difficult project and goes, I guess the three by three case was um, done back in 1915, 1916 by McMahon. Um, there, he enumerated the number of semi-magic squares with a given line sum, and that's a really nice result. In general, there's um, this anand dumir gupta conjecture where you can kind of conjecture the shape of what the counting function is, um, but the exact getting the exact counting functions, it's a very difficult open problem, and but you can... Um, talk about its shape. And, and that's kind of work of Earhart and Stanley, this Stanley's green book, and there the methods are commutative algebra. Okay, so this is getting into the business of syzygies, Hilbert's syzygy, and I guess Hilbert's basis theorem. All right, and so that's, um, if you want to go play with magic squares, part of the game is getting the relations under control. Now, um, I want to do lattice path counting so we can get to counting Latin rectangles and Latin squares. That's really just a byproduct. The origins of this was I'm really interested for the, the graded post sets in the three by three case. The, the whim I had was just to see whether anything could even be done for the four by four and then see if I get anything out of that for, um, say, these syzygies. So in general, let's form a graded post set. And so we'll have semi-magic squares of a fixed size n. The less than or equals are our partial ordering. will just be given by entry-wise comparison. And so then the covering relation is just gonna be given by um, your, so n covers m if you get there by just adding a permutation matrix. And then for this post set, the rank function will be the line sum. What's nice about this post set, we can study it by its finite pieces. So we can just consider um, sub post sets where we cut off at the, the entries at a maximum. And then that's gonna be self dual. And uh, it'll be a finite graded post set with a unique minimum and a unique maximum. And then we can start um, doing things with these. And for this talk, so trying to go beyond the three by three case, if we're gonna to go to larger sizes, we should just stick with uh, maximum one, and that's how we get our zero one semi-magic matrices on the board. And so here, useful analogy, I haven't seen any, uh, I haven't really worked out direct connections here, but the idea would be that the Boolean post set, so here I'm not thinking sets, I'm thinking just tuples of zeros and ones, is to weak compositions. So those would be ordered tuples, I mean, with a weak composition, you typically want all the things add to add up to a given number, but the ranks in that post set would be the given number. And then that's going to be the same as, um, that's going to compare to these zero one semi-magic squares to the entire post set of semi-magic squares. So that um, helps me think about this. 
And so if we go to the three by three, um, we'll call this M31, so maximum one, and we can write down the entire POSA. And so that we have rank zero, rank one is permutation matrices, sums of pairs that don't share ones, and then the J matrix at the top. And we want to count chains in here, or maximal chains. I'll call them lattice pads, just because we're not going to consider any other types of chains. Now, for counting chains, okay. Um, again, I want another analogy, which will be, what do we have? So like a really nice situation is the young lattice where we have um, a significant combinatorial object, young diagrams. We can arrange them in the form of a lattice or a, let's say finite graded post set. It's gonna be Young's lattice. And then um, we'll be able to count paths in this graded post set. Those paths themselves are also gonna be um, significant combinatorial objects. And so for instance, if we consider this path, if I do a construction by just adding one square at a time, and if I keep track of where we put the square, well, we're gonna be generating standard Young tableau. And then these actually are um, high interest. And to count the number of paths is um, the same as counting standard Young tableau. And then that's given by the hook formula, hook length formula which um, is very important for all kinds of reasons. So that's kind of the shape of what I want, or at least try to fit something into the shape. Um, and I'm not gonna come back to the young lattice. I just like it as a compelling example. Now, um, for paths at M31, so I want to sort of an identical picture. So what we're doing with Burkhoff on Neumann, if I have a magic, square, the way I can construct it is by just taking zero and I continually add permutation matrices until um, we get to our square. So that's going to generate, the order is going to matter there. So that's like making a word or making a, a path in the post set from zero to wherever you go. If you use single line notation, so instead of double line or cycle notation, you use single line notation, then as you add um, these permutation matrices in the single line permutation, single line notation, you're stacking these up so that you get Latin rectangles. And that's if we maintain the maximum one property. And so that's kind of the um, analog to what's going on in Young Lattice. The note, I'm not going to go past one. You can go past one. You'll just continue the list, but you'll lose the Latin property along the columns. Okay. So, um, right, if I want to count Latin squares then, then each Latin square, we can back it out to get a distinct path um, maximal chain or from zero to J. Note, if you go to the OEIS to, to look at the, the counts for Latin squares, okay, this is an important open problem. There are only 11 entries. Um, for today, we're only interested in these six, so those are the only ones I'll list, and I'll note, um, of course, this is a current active area of interest. I'm not the expert to give the, the spiel on that. So like I said, I'm just gonna give the kind of over the plate um, explanation of things without getting too much into the, the large research between, behind many of these topics. Okay, so that's paths. So we've got paths in our lattice now um, and they count interesting things, Latin rectangles and Latin squares. Now, to remind you, um, so how do we count paths abstractly? So it'd be great if we had a formula that we could just put in to give us paths, but abstractly, we could just use the, um, so order raising operator, which is basically what you do with um, Pascal's triangle. Only here, it would be Pascal's triangle upside down from the way we teach it to our students, where I start at the bottom, and then to go up, well, if I'm at any node, I just look below at all the elements below and add their path counts to get the new path count. And then that we can just start moving up. And so for instance, for M31, the paths from zero to J, we see we have the 12, which is the number of um, Latin squares of size three. If we wanna go larger, all right, so, to draw this post set for size four, you would need a lot of room and patience. 
So the idea was, well, why don't we just try to work with um, like a large group and we can hope that the group that we use doesn't um, obscure too much of the data. Like we, we don't want a group so large that, um, you know, we just get single orbits. So like for this post set in front of me, the M31, if you mind out by the group I'm gonna um, talk about on the next page, it just turns into a chain with four nodes, which, you know, um, it's good information, but there's more information in um, the post set itself without passing to the group. But in general, what we can get good stuff from um, taking orbits. And so I need a group. The group I wanna use, um, this is the familiar group from linear algebra. I just wanna consider, uh, we can permute rows, we can permute columns and I can transpose. And a moment's thought, that's gonna preserve all the line sums. And so that's gonna preserve the set of magic squares. Not only will it preserve the set of magic squares, it'll also preserve, um, it preserves line sums. So it preserves things that are in the post set. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Missing an idea here that I had practiced. Okay, so if we consider this group, that what it is generated by these, okay, we can represent everything with a faithful action on the magic squares as noted. So we'll have two times n factorial squared elements. The main relations are gonna be that the row operations and column operations commute. If you try to push transpose through a row operation, it becomes a column operation. And then of course we have all the relations from the, um, the symmetric groups. And I'll also note, you can represent these just by multiplying by permutation matrices on each side. I use the inverse on the right-hand side so that we have a group action. So you gotta put things backwards if you want it to work on the right-hand side. And so that's a large group and it's actually gonna give us just enough for what we need. In fact, it's a theorem that this is the automorphism group for the semi-magic squares. Okay, like this, um, these, as noted, will preserve the set of semi-magic squares, but then that's as large as it's gonna get. That, that's not me, I think that's from the 90s. Okay, if we're gonna pass the orbits, so no, I haven't gotten the main results yet, but we're almost there. If we're gonna go to orbits, um, the group action is gonna, drastically reduce the amount of um, data that we need to keep track of. So if it preserves the partial ordering, it's preserving the ranks, it'll preserve the same downset structures, and it'll preserve all the path numbers for a given orbit. So if I wanna count paths uh, to construct the, um, first we gotta construct the post set. We'll need good representatives for orbits. I'll need to know the orbit sizes because I wanna work with the full post set of semi-magic squares, but I don't want to write it down. I just want to use the orbits as reference. We'll need the covering data, and then we'll need the path numbers um, below any given element to use the Pascal rule to bring it up. And of course, um, heavy lifting is going to be done by the orbit stabilizer theorem. So largely, we're talking about orbit sizes. I'm just going to refer to stabilizers and not like show computations of this. Okay, so main results. And so if we form orbits under the groups for the four by fours, okay, so like I said, three by three, you get a chain. If you let it out a little bit for four by four, we'll get a bump in the middle. For notation, okay, so um, I should, that's what I was trying to remember earlier. On the three by three case, I was using the path number, the number of, of paths from zero to your given matrix as a subscript. And so here there's gonna be two subscripts. One is gonna be for the orbit size because this is just a representative. The second one is gonna be the path number from zero to any element that goes with the representative. And so, um, and we'll come back to this in detail in a little bit. Okay, the note, things we can note um, for rank two, the representatives are gonna be derangements, one plus uh, derangement, Rank one, of course, is permutation matrices. And then we've got self-dual to go um, to the top parts. And then path numbers are their own thing, which we'll talk about. So size four, 
size five, okay, we should ditch the matrices on the right and just put in the important um, numbers. So we get this again, self dual uh, permutation matrices, 120, 120. At the top, we've got the number of magic squares in this case. So 161, 280. And um, derangements. And okay, so that's five by five. We'll cut, well, this one we won't quite come back to because once we have four by four figured out, five by five goes exactly with the same techniques. And then wishful thinking is, is this, it's too, is this too good to be true? And yes, it pretty much is. So going to size six, the elements, the orbits themselves are sort of reasonable, but then all the coverings, um, there's heavy lifting to be done here, which I feel you can barely do. Well, I mean, I guess it depends on how much you like computing things, but for like, if I were to go to seven by seven, I'm programming things. And um, this is the first half of size six. Well, the, the main thing to take away from this is we've got in rank two, four derangements. And then in rank three, we've got um, six elements, six orbits for rank three. And those are gonna be the graphs on the, on the title page. Okay, we have seven on the title page. Two of them are gonna get um, bound together under the group action now. Second half of the result. All right, so again, this is a thing only an actuary could love, a big table full of data. Um, what we have at the bottom are the derangements, okay, so that we're indexing there. So we've got our four derangements. Uh, and let me to help with the table, because of course this is far too much to expect people to digest in the talk. It's for the slides for later. But um, the first, so there are two, think of this as the same table twice with regards to the columns. Four columns, you got your representative just given as a label. You have the rank that you're in, you have the orbit size, and then you've got the path number, which is the number of um, paths from zero to your representative. Interesting the things to note right now for the derangements, powers of two for the number of paths, and then the Latin square count we're getting um, for the J. And then, like I said, data presentation, it's like a thrill that you can partition things so that this all fits nicely into a rectangle without having to break any of the ranks. All right, like I said, this not really good for a talk, but definitely worth noting the significant parts. There are numbers, this number of the Latin square counts probably the main thing to take away from here with the derangements that I'm using. Now, Going back to the four by four case. So this, this is generalities for all the cases that we do. Uh, ranks zero and one should be pretty clear, I hope. That's, so rank zero and one, um, there that's more or less always gonna be the same. The, you'll have ones everywhere except for the number of elements in rank one. We can use duality, okay? So here I'm writing down how we do the dual. That's just gonna be subtract everything off of J. So if I have a zero one matrix, J minus a zero one matrix is a new zero one matrix. And so we could flip up the orbit numbers and the elements, but for the paths, we still have to um, use our order raising operator or the Pascal's triangle. And so that's something um, we, that has to be dealt with kind of as its own thing. And so, these will be in all three cases. Rank two, um, as noted, we expect arrangements here. And so were we to take any two permutation matrices and add them together, we can always factor out the first one. And if we have maximum one condition, then we have to have zeros on the diagonal, which means no fixed points. Um, all the derangements are conjugate to each other since we're in the symmetric group. Or not all the derangements in a given class are conjugate to one another since we're in the symmetric group. But then you can also show if we use like the action on the left or right, you're not going to be able to um, put two different derangement classes in the same orbit. So they characterize orbits. For stabilizers, the derangements of the structure is um, basic enough that you can work them out. 
um, directly, but for what I'm gonna do for size six using hypergraphs will work here too. And that's kind of nice. I won't do it in here, but once I show you size six, it gives away the game for all the others. You're only limited by what you can draw. For the path numbers in rank two, um, so the rule here is, and there, there's some things to, to say or show, I guess, but if you write your permutation as uh, disjoint product cycles, you can take any splitting into two parts. So these are not cycles themselves, they're just the collections of the cycles. Then you can write I plus your permutation as a sum of those two parts. Right. And so if we're talking about paths, we want to add two of these, but I want that they, um, the order is going to matter for a path. And so you'll get two to C paths where C is the number of disjoint cycles in your permutation that you're using. And so that gives the two to a power for the derangements. Now, coming back to the post set for four. All right. So what do we have? Okay. So no, um, as noted, the ones where they should go, the number of permutations, the, we, we have derangements. So those numbers you can work out. We got the powers of two. We have the Latin square number for size four at the top. And then the one thing that's at issue is the 24, which is not too hard to work out by hand, but I wanna do it sort of as a general argument because you'll just use that for cases five and six. Um, you just have to adjust a little bit for case six. So, um, how do I tell when one of these matrices covers another matrix? First thing to note is we don't have to consider everything at once. We're gonna take advantage of the group action. I just need to know how many, you're just gonna have to do this for each node in the, the post set um, that, that actually covers anything. What we'll do, we'll pick a representative. We'll set up a tree to determine where I can extract a permutation. So by Burkhoff on Neumann, um, we can build up one of these zero one matrices by adding permutations to it. Um, so to step down, I just have to figure out what things I can subtract off. Once I've done that, um, the question is, what did you just step down to? And so if we're in rank three, it's not so bad. So what I would do is say, I know I can remove the string two, one, three, four. Okay. And what do I mean by that? Um, Let's consider this element as the representative. Really, you'd use J minus I, but I like keeping the I in the middle. We're going to take out two, one, three, four. What I mean by that is I'm going to represent my zero, one matrix as a Latin rectangle. Note, the Latin rectangle is actually a path. If I just forget about the horizontal order, um, you get the square. But actually, it's a little bit worse than that because um, the, uh, it's a many to one Latin squares to a zero one matrix. So, but I could still use this to represent it. If I want to take out two, one, three, four, I'm just going to take out the string two, one, three, four from the Latin rectangle. We get height two. And then we're allowed to do um, the group action. And the group action of switching columns is the same as switching columns in the matrix. So that's going to give me the class one plus a four cycle. And then we'll need to do that over and over again. Okay, sorry for the picture, but it gets everything on the page. And so say I'm still talking about this Latin rectangle from the previous page. I won't put the matrix up again. We wanna consider all strings that I can remove from this Latin rectangle. So what are we gonna do? We'll go through column by column and just build one part of the string at a time. And the only rule is you can't reuse a digit if you used it before. And so for the, this rectangle, we've got nine cases. One of them's a two, one, three, four that we used before. And when we run that procedure through all nine cases, six of them will go to the, to the four cycle derangement. Three of them will go to the uh, pair transpositions. And so that's going to give us the 24. And that's a little overkill for the for case size four. But for five and six, for five, 
we really don't need no, we don't need any new ideas, except now I'm gonna need trees for two levels instead of just one level. Um, right. And so five, again, we've got the ones where we want, we've got the number of permutation matrices, we've got derangements, we've got powers of two, and then we've got Latin squares at the top. And then self dual is worth noting also. All right. Um, again, this slide is just here to be here. It's too much information to take in in a one hour. Well, you wouldn't want to take it in a one hour talk anyways for the slides for later. So here, what do we have? We've got the ones where they should go. We've got the permutation matrices. We have the four derangements from before. The paths are powers of two. We can self dual to get the top part, which has the Latin square count, the 800 million and change. And then the thing that's still at issue, like after doing all that is, is that um, what's happening in the middle, we still haven't addressed at all. And so that's gonna be the next big idea. And then that gets us out of here. So rank three. So what's still missing from rank three? Okay, we need representatives for orbits. Um, once we have them, we got to figure out stabilizers. And then we'll need the path numbers for ranks three and rank four, and then we can move to the top. And of course, like if you're programming, you probably need something that's a little bit more algorithmic than what I'm going to do. But I want to be able to read all of these things off purely from pictures. And so that's where hypergraphs are going to come in. So what we'll do, we're going to treat M as an incidence matrix. And so um, I'm not going to do the full hypergraph spiel since all I want to talk about is what we had on the title page. So I'm just going to assume we're going to talk about um, hypergraphs that are both three uniform and three regular. Okay, so our semi magic property um, will give hypergraphs that are k uniform and k regular and that ties these three ideas together. Consideration, okay, so three uniform, this is the problem from the title page. Okay, three uniform says our hyper edges are triangles. Three regular says we have to have three triangles at each vertex. And then we'll do this pictorially, uh, consideration of like these structures that show up that are incident to one another, that'll reduce it to seven possibilities and then transpose is gonna tie two of those possibilities together. Right, one more before we get to the, the hypergraphs. So actually I shouldn't consider just hypergraphs, like I shouldn't consider a hypergraph under the group action, we should consider pairs. Because if I wanna use transpose, then um, we're gonna switch between like the vertex edge hypergraph to the edge vertex hypergraph. Or I could just think of that as two hypergraphs where one of them has the edges recorded by columns and then one where it's recorded. Well, if I transpose then in the original, it's the words, but I can get two hypergraphs. And for the six by six, they all wind up being, um, when you transpose, you wind up in the same class. You might not be have a symmetric incidence matrix, but you'll land in the same class under the group action. And then there's gonna be one case where the two classes will be distinct. Okay, and then here, this just notes um, under the group action, what you're actually doing to the hypergraphs. And so there's an action on pairs. Now, let's take a look. And so the, the data I'm gonna, so the, first off to start off, you wanna start off here, because if somebody asks you to write down a six by six semi-magic square with line sum three, and you're only allowed to use zeros and ones, this would be the very first thing I would write down. Um, what we'll do, so this is an incidence matrix. So the columns are gonna be the hyper edges. And if I, a bad speaker, I did not put the, um, the labeling in, but the labeling would be put the one at the top and go clockwise. So we have one, two, three appearing three times four, five, six appearing three times. And we can always Latinize the, um, what's coming out of the matrix. Like I could make this as one, two, three, one, two, three, and so on. But this can always be put in 
Latin form by the construction. And note, this middle is not unique. So there'll be many ways that um, we can write this matrix on the left. And so the distinguishing feature here is the, the nested triangles and threes. It's also worth noting, how do we get the stabilizer from the picture? Well, here you can get it from, uh, let's get it from the matrix and then just say what's going on in the picture and then we'll go backwards for the other ones. So what can I do with the matrix? Well, you can do column switches in the first three. Well, that's just permuting the hyper edges with the one, two, three. Um, not changing vertices, just changing the edges. Likewise for columns four through six, if we change the first three rows, that's gonna be an actual symmetric group on the triangle, flipping the vertices around. And we can do that in two different ways. So we'll get S3 to the fourth power because they all commute. And then um, we can switch the triangles, the shapes themselves. So that's another two. And then I'll also note um, if we have the pair, the equivalence that maps this to its dual, which really is just transpose in this case, is going to make you bump up the graph stabilizer or graph autom automorphism group by a factor of two. And then when you do the orbit stabilizer theorem, you get your orbit size. And so now we just take a trip to the zoo and look at what makes each of these different. So that's three triangles. If we do two nested triangles, I can do it with pairs of these. Um, the real distinguishing feature here though is gonna be that we have two triple edges. So we have um, the nested pairs of triangles also pair up against a non-nested triangle. And that's gonna severely limit your ability to um, create automorphisms. And so here that's gonna be the Z2, which just switches end to end on the triple edges. And, oh, actually I gotta be careful with this. You've got the switch and end to end on the triple edges. The, in, the nested triangles, that's switching the hyper edges. And then we can also flip. And then you got to multiply two because it's a self dual to get 64. And so that's on um, pairs of double triangles. We can get a single double triangle here. Um, when drawn pictures of these, it's really easy to miss, or at least gotta be careful because I always, often I, I get miscounts because this looks like two double triangles, but it's really a double triangle and a cycle of double edges. And so that'll give you an S3, which will control the vertices up top. And we can also interchange the hyper edges up top. So that'll give you um, actually just 12 elements. We can't bump up this by two because this is not dual. It's not um, equivalent to its dual. Its dual is gonna look like this one here, which has no shared triangle. And when you're doing the dual, it's kind of um, you know, like keep track of how the vertices and the hyper edges interchange when you flip the matrix. You can see that in the picture. So here, this is the one from the first page. We've got a triple edge, and then we got a vertex with three double edges coming off of it. And again, this one's really part of um, 1A. And then we're leaving shared triangles now for, like the last one didn't have a shared triangle, but it was at least associated to one that had a shared triangle. Going to double edges, these come off pretty quickly. What you can do, you can do just six cycle shared edges. So this is um, basically just put one triangle at each edge and the adjacent vertices, or at each vertex and the adjacent vertices and go around. So that'll get 24 elements. This, I think this one's the prettiest one. This is the, um, the pinwheel. Here you've got three double edges that don't touch each other. Um, the group here, you can um, permute the double edges, you can flip them end to end, but we have to make sure we maintain the orientation of the triangles in the middle. So that's gonna give you 24, you bump it up to 48. And then finally, we have the, um, this is double four double edges that are paired against each other. And so here again, those double edges control um, how many symmetries you can have. And we have to cut that in half because we've got to maintain the, um, the two triangles at the bottom. And so that's um, counts.
That's how we get all of our orbit numbers. We get our stabilizers. What's left is figuring out how do you adjust your algorithm from before to figure out the covering data? Well, before in the case we talked about, it was always we were going down to two possible cases, which is not so bad to figure out which of the two cases you're in by just looking at the Latin rectangle you wind up with. For height three, well, for me, I didn't want to sit down and try to figure out something that would um, work without actually doing any programming, but there's a nice visual what you would do. So same, pro same um, algorithm as before. If I want to do rank four over rank three, say we take this string coming out of this Latin rectangle, this, this um, compresses down to here. We could draw all the hyper edges and then I'll note I've got three double edges at a vertex. I don't even need to keep track of the triple edge, but you could, and you, that would give away what this is. So this is going to step down to class 1B. And then um, for rank four, this is 322 checks. And so that, on the cusp of reasonable, it's not very difficult to do, but it's very tedious because you just do the same thing over and over again. And um, actuary powers will make that um, certainly not such a, as bad as it sounds. Okay, and so um, just some final thoughts. That's what I wanted to talk about. Okay, as I already noted, um, the, the research program here is about three by three semi-magic squares to get to clutch Gordon coefficients. And so kind of um, one thing that's on my mind is finding other situations that look like clutch Gordon coefficients that are, coming out of combinatorial objects and not legal groups. So that's um, something I've been thinking about. Another thing that the real motivation for this talk is related to that, but also out of um, this Kletch Gordon theory, there's, a, there's analogs of Chu Vandermond convolution um, for finite graded post sets. And so uh, like, this is the, the Chu Vandermond. That's um, something you can state in terms of things happening in Pascal's triangle and then consideration of Pascal's triangles of finite graded post set. There's a, some formulas that you can write down that mimic the classical version of this. Now that thing, um, it, it's no replacement for using the incidence algebra or the, the Mobius function of the, the post set. Those are very like um, fine tuned machinery. This thing's like taking crowbar or sledgehammer to a post set. That's what I did in the six by six case. So this would get reused over and over again to make sure the numbers are coming out correctly. And then of course, later on, I discovered the paper by Stones where the, the tables for all the, the total counts are. So I don't know, I haven't looked closely to see if they have orbit counts, um, but the total counts are there and that would have made it a little bit easier than using this over and over again. And then also there's the thing about syzygy. So one thing we can get out of the post sets too is also just how um, non-unique your semi-magic square, at least in the part of the post set that I'm looking at is by considering um, the number of paths into it. And that's, um, there's a lot, that, that could be its own talk almost. And I'm not the person for that. Like I highly recommend Stanley's 2014 NYU talk. So he has this on his website, the title, is magic squares and syzygies, I think, but the PDF is Durer PDF. So Durer's got the famous um, picture with a magic square in it. And this, there's a lot, it's a hundred page PDF. So there's a lot of good stuff in there, but he does a lot of um, the number work for size four. And so that's kind of um, interesting to look at and try to wonder how you could get your handle on, get a handle on some of those numbers directly, maybe not so much with um, powerful, um, commutative algebra methods. And though, um, I don't know, maybe that's already a thing that, that's known. So um, that's the talk. So thank you. Um, should note, it's like I said, it's my 10 year. Things have been really helpful in my 10 years. The CANT workshop we have at CUNY. Uh, with the pandemic, I've been able to participate in the Emmy Nother seminar at Erlangen. And also this summer, there was um, this excellent Lattice Path Enumeration Conference. So they have this like every four years or so since 1984. In the beginning, it didn't meet so often. 
but now it, it it's regularly seems to be every four years and it, it's a week long. I was I found out about it literally on the first day, so I didn't get to show up till the second day. And the organizer extremely generous and hospitable, like um to let me participate, even though like I probably had no connections to any people there. And so finally, just um, some of the books I'm using. For references, you can check the preprint. I would love if um, experts in the audience can direct me to better things that I'm using. I'd love to hear that. Um, one thing I definitely should highlight, well, they're all worth highlighting, but um, the Stones paper, maybe not so well known as these other books because these are classics. Um, Stones book has, there's a lot of papers on formulas for Latin rectangles. Um, but they typically don't put the actual tables of Latin rectangles in there, the counts. And so this paper has it and a lot of other good stuff in there too. So that made things really convenient late in the game. And so that's, um, that's my talk and thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Robert. It was a very nice talk. Questions? You can just unmute yourself and speak. Otherwise, let's thank Robert again and I will stop the recording. Thank you, Robert.